Amen. You can be seated. Um, you know, this journey started and this issue of divine reversal. I mean, we've been, we've been participating with national events for, you know, for decades now. But I want to kind of just bring this into focus about where do we go from here. Uh, because as I said, I believe that this is a new beginning in our nation. You realize that what happened is that on Friday, um, up until that point, abortion, or can I say it this way, a blood sacrifice altar was codified through a Supreme Court decision from 1973 that legalized 63 million abortions. That's a lot of bloodshed. And I think that if you really look back on the history of our nation and the history of what's happened since that point, you can see that we, we're, we're not a better nation because of it. That a lot of things have shaken in our nation and a lot of things that have to do with family values have shaken. But you know, I think it's really interesting that as, as Apostle Tom started talking about divine reversal, seven years ago, um, on the, in the beginning of January, um, the Lord gave me a word about divine reversal. And, uh, and we started preaching divine reversal out of the book of Esther. And Esther, for those of you that know, you know that the book of Esther doesn't actually even mention God. Do you know that? But it mentions the king. And so you've got, to, you've got the king Ahasuerus, who was a wicked pagan king. And Hebrew scholars actually say that every place you see the, king, the king's full name, King Ahasuerus, it talks about what he did in that day. But then there's also another layer that's talking about the king of kings. And so when you picture King Ahasuerus stretching his scepter of favor out to Esther, and saying, ask what you want up to half of my kingdom, what we're to see is that Esther is actually the story of the church. It's the story of the ecclesia who has been brought up in a time to overthrow a decree of death and destruction. Probably everybody in here is familiar with the story of Esther, but if you're not, we know that Esther was a, a, Jew, a, a Jewish woman that was part of the captivity. The, the children of Israel had been carried away in Babylonian captivity, and they were dispersed throughout the Persian Empire, Babylonian Persian Empire. And she was living in one of the capital cities called Shushan. And this was after a lot of the Jewish people had returned back to Jerusalem and had begun to rebuild the city. But many of the Jews still stayed in the land, but they were hated. They were despised by a lot of the people because remember, they were a different people. They were a peculiar people. They were monotheistic, which means they, they worshiped one God. Whereas the pagans worshiped all kinds of gods and lived very uh, uh, lascivious lives, um, they, the Jewish people lived morally pure lives and they worshiped one God. And so they were really despised and reviled in the culture that they were living in. You realize that that really should be the picture of the church. We were never called to be just a subculture of the place that we were living in, but we were actually called to be a counter culture. That means that we're not going to look like the world. We're not supposed to look like and act like the world. And so in the days of the Jewish people in Shushan, Mordecai uh, was one that actually exposed some things that were going on in the land. And so there was this evil, wicked man whose name was Haman. Not Haman. Okay? Don't be like casting out the spirit of Haman. Okay? That is our name. Haman. All right? So Haman was an enemy of the Jews, and it says this of Haman. It says that he was the son of Hamadatha. Hamadatha means double, which I believe in this case was double wickedness. How many are believing that God's going to give us double for our trouble? Amen? So he was the son of Hamadatha, but it says repeatedly that he was an Agagite. Well, what is an Agagite? An Agagite is a descendant of the Amalekite king, Agag. And 
the Amalekites were a warring tribe, a bloodthirsty tribe that was the first army that Israel ever came up against in battle. When they were coming out of Egypt, the Amalekites and Israel squared off in the battle where, if you remember, Moses' hands were lifted up and, and, uh, and, and uh, the two men came and stood on both sides and while his hands were up, Joshua was down fighting the battle. Do y'all remember that? Well, that was against the Amalekites. And the Amalekites' name actually means robber or plunderer, and it means bloodthirsty. It actually means blood liquor is what the name means, but very bloodthirsty. And so we see the Amalekites are a spirit of robbery that are sent against the people of God to rob, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Does it sound familiar to you? Come on, the, it's, it, Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief comes but to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. That phrase, life more abundantly, means superior in quality and superabundant in quantity, exceedingly, abundantly, far and beyond. When you look it up, it means more. How many believe God wants to give us more? It means more and more and more. That's what it says when you look that word up. And so the Amalekites were a spirit of robbery. They came to rob several different things. They came to rob your prosperity. Because it was the Amalekites that fought in the days of Gideon in Judges chapter 6. And it says that they robbed the threshing floor with the, with the tribe of, Mid, of the Midianites. They were always robbing from Israel. And how many know that that's what the devil wants to do? He wants to rob. But they also were sent to cut off posterity. You know what posterity is? That's our children, our children's children, and our children's children's children. It's a bloodthirsty spirit. Does it just kind of describe this whole thing? And so what, what Haman did is he made a decree in Shushan that was distributed to all the provinces of the empire. And here's what his decree said. It said, on the 13th day of Adar, that's a, 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 a month, that wherever you find a Jewish person, or let's put it this way, wherever you find one of God's people, you can rise up and kill them and take their possessions. So you see right there, that Amalekite spirit wanted to cut off prosperity and posterity. Wanted to cut off, take their possessions, but it wanted to cut off their lineage, their legacy. And how many understand that's what's behind this, this issue of abortion? It's cutting off a generation. You realize if you were to look at that generation during which time the 63 million children have died, that's a third of the generation. A third of the generation. So we need to understand that the enemy has always sought to kill a generation before an outbreak of freedom, revival, deliverance, and breakthrough. He did it in the days of Moses when he tried to take out, he killed all the children trying to kill Moses because they knew prophetically a deliverer was arising. They did it in the days of Jesus. They killed all the baby boys that were born around Jesus' time. That's why Jesus, uh, Father Joseph, had to take them off to Egypt. Because the enemy is always sensitive to the time of the outbreak of God's plan and purpose in the earth. And he always seeks to kill a generation. Does that bring it into perspective just a little bit? And so Haman made this decree of death and destruction. And we know the story that Esther, um, she... Mordecai challenged her and said, listen, you know, if you remain silent, God will raise up somebody else, but you and your house will be destroyed. And he said, who knows whether you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Come on, church, we have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. This is a word to the ecclesia. It's not a word to women. It's not just a word to women. It is a word to God's ecclesia, God's church, that he's raising us up today to let our voice be heard. And you know what Esther said? She said, okay, if I perish, I perish. I'm going to go for it. And so we know that the story of Esther is that she prepared a banquet for the king. She found favor with the king. And then after a series of things that I'll just shorten it, is that she exposed to the king Haman's wicked plot. And so Haman 
in his attempt, the king was so mad when he found out about this, he kind of walks out on the balcony, and you can read it in chapter 7. Haman goes to beg for his life from Queen Esther because he knows that he's in trouble. And when he does that, he kind of falls across her bed, like on her, and the king walks in at that moment and says, okay, what are you doing here with my queen? And then he ordered his execution. Now, that was chapter 7 of the book of Esther. But I want you to understand something. Though Haman was dead, his decree was irrevocable. So what they believe that once you made a decree or once you made a law in that day, in that empire, it could never be revoked. So Esther comes before the king in chapter 8, and she, she, she comes before him. He stretches out the scepter, and he says to her, what is it that you want, Esther? And I'm going to read it to you. Because I've been telling you Bible, but some of you don't feel like you've been to church until you listen to me actually read it. So I will read it for you. I could quote it for you, but I will read it for you so that you believe me. All right, so. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, verse 7, I'm sorry, of chapter 8. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and Mordecai the Jew, Indeed, I have given Esther the house of Haman... And they have hanged him on the gallows because he tried to lay his hands on the Jews. Listen to what he says. He says, you yourself write a new decree. So here he's saying, that, yes, there's this decree that's in motion. I've given you the house of Haman. I've done my part. Now you've got to do your part. Hear what the word of the Lord's saying. I've done my part. You've got to do your part. You yourself write a new decree. Write it in the king's name and seal it with the king's signet ring. For whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring, no one can revoke. So he was saying this. Yes, I know that there's this decree that's in motion, but what I want you to do is to write a new decree that will supersede the decree of the enemy. Amen? And I believe that all over the states, I believe that we're seeing a new decree that's going forth in this nation. And that which is thought to be irrevocable has been revoked. Yes. 